Well, welcome, and this is the first of a series of interviews with candidates for the North Carolina Judiciary uh, in this year's uh, election in November. Uh, today, our first uh, guest is Justice Samuel J. Irvin IV, uh, and we're delighted to have Justice Irvin. This is being broadcast live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and the radio, and there will be an opportunity to, for a rebroadcast uh, on, on uh, WPVM 103.7 here in Nashville. So uh, we're, we're delighted again to have this opportunity to uh, talk with Justice uh, Sam J. Irvin IV, and I've, I've got to ask you, Justice Irvin, um, what do your friends and family call you? They usually call me Jim or Jimmy. If, if they stop there, I answer to hey there. Uh, <laughs> I referee soccer matches at, at the high school and youth level, and I answer to all kinds of things there that we <laughs> probably can't talk about on the radio. Yeah. But uh, typically, I've always gone professionally by Sam J. Irvin IV because that's my full name. But uh, my friends and family usually refer to me when they're not angry as, uh, as, as Jim or Jimmy. Well, I will use appropriate uh, protocol on on, uh, on this interview and refer to you as Justice Irvin. Uh, and I, I want to begin, we're going to divide this uh, interview into three parts. I want to talk some about, about you personally, your background, uh, and then I want to talk about the court uh, and your responsibilities uh, as, as a justice on the Supreme Court. And then we'll talk about the campaign. The purpose of these interviews are to give listeners an opportunity to get to know um, uh, each of the candidates. I would note that I believe your opponent in the upcoming election uh, has not uh, responded uh, to the invitation to appear. So uh, it's not that we're demonstrating any uh, specific preference, uh, but we're, we're appreciative of you taking time to talk with us. I'm, 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 I'm always glad to talk to whoever's willing to talk to me. <laughs> I understand. So you're from Morganton, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, now, tell us a little bit about the family history, because there's a lot, a lot of family history there. Well, there the, uh, the family history is that my family moved to Morganton from South Carolina in the 1870s. My great-grandfather was a novelist and a school teacher. That was a fairly difficult economic uh, situation to be in in the uh, 1870s, and so he left South Carolina and moved to Morganton. His son, Sam Irvin Sr., my great-grandfather, my great read law, uh, practiced briefly in Wilkesboro, and then moved, came back to Morganton, where the family was, as I understand it, and practiced law then until, he, until his death in 1944. He never held public office, except that he was uh, a member of the city of Morganton school board, but he was active in the community of all of his uh, adult life. My grandfather, his oldest uh, child, uh, was a grew up in Morganton, was a graduate of Carolina, went to uh, uh, Europe in World War II, served in the military, was wounded severely, won a distinguished service cross, came back to North Carolina, and then uh, decided instead of practicing law, my understanding is he had already read law in his, his father's office and was licensed already. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to law school and he did the, far as I can tell, the unique trick of going to law school backward in that he went to, took the third year first, the second year second, and the first year third. Now his, his version of why that happened was that uh, my grandfather, my grandmother promised not to marry anybody else for another year, three years in a row, so he could go back. Sure. My great aunt, whose version I actually believe, uh, said that he, uh, uh, that the family came up with the money to send him back up there. But at any rate, he came back in 1922 and began practicing in, in, with his father. He practiced law off and on for uh, almost 20 years, but he also served in the state uh, house three times, was a, a special superior court judge, was elected to Congress briefly in 1944. He was appointed to the North Carolina Supreme Court and served on that body till he was appointed to the United States Senate by Governor Umstead in 1954 and then served in the Senate till 1974. He is most famous for his involvement in the uh, investigation of the uh, 
so-called Watergate affair, which was uh, you know, put him on the put him on the uh, TV all day, every day for months at a time, which was kind of a strange experience for a 16 year old to watch. Uh, you know, you're not used to seeing your grandfather on TV all the time, but he, he was there. He retired. Well, he, he was very famous. Uh, well, he, and, he was, yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we all all loved that Western North Carolina accent uh, from the Watergate hearings where he would refer to himself as just a country lawyer. But he right. Was, I, tr I tried that line once or twice and it didn't <laughs> work. But uh, it, it, at any rate, my, my father, his son, uh, also grew up in Morganton, uh, went to law school at, at Harvard the conventional way, and then practiced from 1950, roughly 1951 until 1967. He served a couple of terms in the North Carolina House and then uh, was appointed by Governor Moore to be a, a, the resident superior court judge for the what was then the three-county district of uh, Burke, Caldwell, and Catawba, served on that as a superior court judge, which is probably when you first met him. Uh, and I, I want to tell you, he was one of my favorite uh, judges that I ever appeared in front of, a, a truly uh, excellent judge and a delightful individual. Well, he, 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 try, he tried to treat everybody well. He used to tell the story one time he was holding court down in Lincoln County, uh, and he gave a defendant some incredibly long sentence. Now, the defendant deserved every bit of it, as best I could tell. Uh, but uh, it, the typical practice, as you know, was for the attorney after sentence had been pronounced to say, thank you, Your Honor, and then leave the courtroom. Well, the lawyer did that. Then so did the defendant, who said, thank you, Your Honor. And Dad was a little mystified by that because he just put him in prison for decades. Uh, and, and Dad said he went over to the bailiff after it was over, asked the bailiff why the defendant did that after he'd given him such a long sentence. And the bailiff's response was, well, you did it in such a nice way. <laughs> uh, but he then was appointed by President Carter in 1980 to be one of North Carolina's then two judges on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and served on the Fourth Circuit until his death in 1999. So that's that's the family history. My brother is a superior court judge now. My sister, who lives in Asheville, is a retired federal probation officer. We can't seem to get away from the court system to save our lives. So you always knew you were going to be a lawyer? No, I did not. I mean, my parents uh, were very concerned that their children not go into the legal system just because everybody else had. And so they encouraged us to think about other alternatives. I went to went to Davidson undergrad and uh, I thought pretty seriously about getting a Ph.D. in history, but decided in, in teaching at the, at the university level. And Davidson is a Presbyterian school, also made you take religion courses. And I had grown up in the Presbyterian Sunday school and uh, was a little surprised, frankly, to find how interesting I thought academic religion courses were. I never had any sense that I had a calling to the parish ministry or anything. But I, before realizing that you had to learn, uh, learn Greek and Hebrew in order to get a Ph.D. in <laughs> theology, uh, thought about doing that and then teaching it, but finally decided that I really preferred being in the court system and doing something a little less academic and a little bit more real world. And I don't regret having made that decision back at the time that I made it, but that's not the only thing I ever thought about. Yeah. So uh, you went to Harvard Law School following in your father's footsteps, right. I guess your grandfather's footsteps, uh, right. and uh, came back to Morganton and practiced law. I did. And then and we I was in a firm that was was then known as Bird Bird, Irvin, Whistnet, McMahon and Irvin. My senior partner somehow thought that it was appropriate to have everybody's name in the firm name. I told them they weren't the ones having to answer the phone. And <laughs> uh, but you know, we I practiced with some iteration of that firm from 1981 to 1999 and did a very general kind of practice. I went to district court. I handled superior, civil, superior court, criminal and civil matters, uh, ultimately kind of gravitated in, and this is where I think you and I first met, right. was I, I gravitated into doing most of my firm's appellate work, and we must have been appeal happy at the time because I did a lot of that. And also, we had a client in, in, in Morganton who was a major consumer of electricity, and so I began representing first that client and then others in front of the State Utilities Commission, which was a practice that I really enjoyed. And so I had this very strange practice of a specialized uh, utility commission practice 
combined with a small town general trial practice, which was actually not been bad, bad preparation for being on the appellate courts once I got there. So uh, at, at some point, you got an opportunity to serve on the utility commission. I did. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I did. And I was appointed. Uh, and that's one of those processes where you have to be both nominated and confirmed. And that was at a time when, let's say, relations between gov the governor and the legislature were not at their apogee. I'll just put yeah. it that way. Uh, but eventually was appointed and confirmed to serve beginning in 1999. I took uh, a former uh uh, Circuit Court Judge Allison Duncan's seat on the Court of Appeals and the, on, on the on the Utilities Commission, and then ironically, a few years later, she took my dad's seat on the Fourth Circuit. So we've I've been trying to tell Allison, ask Allison, what were we going to do next? Uh, but you know, I've served on that body for a long time, and and, and as you know from your own experience, the uh, Utilities Commission is a very little understood body, but it has a lot it has a lot of important functions which can be summarized as the um, making sure that the rates charged for public utility service which is now electric and natural gas and water and sewer and interestingly home movers at that time it also included telecommunication services but that's been deregulated it was being deregulated during my time on the commission and i don't think the commission has much jurisdiction over telecommunication services now but we made sure given that the providers were, were uh, given a legal monopoly service territory that they didn't charge too much and that their service remained of sufficient quality to make sure that people got the utility services that they needed and it was really i mean it was a really interesting 10 years i enjoyed doing that very very much well I'll, I'll have to say from my experience on on the spring court uh utility rate cases were very painful for those of us who were not as well versed in utility law as you and well i mean i, I will have to say that having argued several of them i think in front of you one time uh the the pain was fairly obvious <laughs> uh, touche yes all right well before we get into your judicial career Tell us a little more about you and your family personally. You still live in Morganton. You haven't I still live in Morganton. I drove, I'm, I'm sitting in Raleigh at the moment, but I drove down here from Morganton this morning. My wife and I live in the old Irvin family home place that was built by my great grandfather. My brother lives in my grandfather's house across the street. We tell folks that neither one of us have gotten very far in life because we basically went up we were taken home from the hospital to a house two blocks away. And so we've come up the hill basically. Uh, but my wife and I uh, still live in the old family home place. I married into two stepchildren who have two of our own. Uh, all of them are now grown and are doing very well. And we're, we're very proud of them. My wife is retired is a retired social worker and school nurse uh, and spends most of her time now teaching and playing old time fiddle music. Does she go on the campaign trail with you? Well, she doesn't. She's she is not. That's not her idea of a good time. She is. <laughs> I think pro, she's. She has two classes. She's got to teach this afternoon and uh, played a uh, played a uh, square dance or something yesterday at the uh, Altamont uh, Orchard in, uh, off the Parkway up at up near Little Switzerland. So that she is. She really enjoys that, and uh, that keeps her occupied it gives her an excuse not to go out on the campaign trail and and you did say something about uh refereeing soccer games i gotta ask you how you got into that well i got it i got into that you, you know you don't have a full body picture of me but let's put it this way i am not uh your standard view of an athlete and uh my my both of my stepchildren were actually very good soccer players and there was an entity called the Burke Soccer Association that my wife became the referee coordinator for and oh. she did not have enough referees <laughs> so she told me that I was going to become a referee and my first thought was nobody in their right mind wants me to referee anything uh but I spent in the middle of a five-week utility hearing in 1996 I spent Saturday and Sunday when I thought I would be doing what I should have been doing in my law office for the preceding week and getting ready for the next week of hearing, I learned the rules of soccer and then went out the following weekend, uh, a week after being passing this written test that certified me to be a soccer referee. And I refereed my first soccer match. And we had, there was a fight in the first soccer. <laughs> and 
amazingly enough, I actually enjoyed it and I still do it. I don't this this year I'm having to take a take a year off. But yeah, I, I, I assume you, you enjoyed the refereeing, not the fight that you witnessed. Yeah, well, the, the, yeah. I've only had two fights in yeah. my entire 20, I guess it's 25 years now. But I've done high school matches, uh, you know, do age group matches. I've been was the fourth official in two state high school championships. I was the I was an assistant referee in another one. Uh, you know, I'm not the best judge of whether I'm any good or not, but they either are so desperate for officials, they'll let me do it, or the assigner is satisfied with the quality of the work that I do. But it's a nice change from sitting behind a desk all day. And I really enjoy having some opportunity to continue to be, you know, active outside. I know that I'm getting to an age where that's not going to be a realistic option anymore. Yeah, running but, up and down the field gets a little tougher. Uh, as we put some years on. Well, at some point in time in your career, you decided you wanted to run for office. You chose not uh, the legislature or Congress, but the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Tell us how that came about and in, in that experience. Well, that, that, that came about because of I had tried to get appointed to the Court of Appeals several times to fill vacancies. And for various reasons of uh, the governors who considered appointing me decided that they would appoint somebody else a number of times. I had, in, in spite of the fact that I, and this was when I was on the utilities commission, I, in, even though I enjoyed that work, I knew I couldn't make a long-term career out of it. It's, it's not an office that anybody holds permanently. And so I also wanted to get back into just regular law because that's what I'd done for almost 18 years and thought that, the Court of Appeals would be a good good match for what I think of as my temperament and my abilities. Again, others can decide for themselves whether that's an accurate assessment. Uh, and so I finally realized you're not going to get appointed to the Court of Appeals. And the only other option was to run. And I had, like most other small town lawyers, been involved in political campaigns and so forth for other people. I knew what they were, what they involved. I didn't particularly want to be a candidate, but I did want to serve on the Court of Appeals. And so finally bit the bullet in 2008 and filed about a day and a half before the filing period ended and then drove off to a uh, utility hearing, I think in Salisbury, if my memory is not failing me. In fact, thinking to myself as I drove up there, what did you just do? <laughs> and uh then spent the next from February to November and we had both a primary and a, a general election and I ran up and down the state as best I could and was, you know, fortunate enough to be successful. And uh, we, we haven't said this up to this point, but you are the Democrat nominee for right. uh, the seat you currently hold on the Supreme Court. Your party uh, is uh, Democrat. And yeah. so, um, judiciary was a little different back then from a standpoint of mm -hmm. uh, elections. It, it was, it was very different. These were nonpartisan races. And I had, because the utilities commission is subject to the code of judicial conduct, just like the judicial branch, I'd been out of partisan politics for a decade at that point. And uh, uh, it, it, it's always seemed to me and continues to seem to me that if we're going to elect judges in the state constitution says that we are, uh, and I don't see any realistic reason to believe that that's going to change. Uh, it's always seemed to me that electing judges in nonpartisan elections was more reflective of what judges actually do. And so I, that was one of the reasons I was willing to go ahead and file that year was because I knew I would be involved in a nonpartisan election. And so, you know, I'm not so naive as to think that political parties, even under that system, weren't interested in who got elected. But as a practical matter, in my race in 2008, uh, my general election opponent was another Democrat. And we yeah, certainly, had, yeah. certainly had races. On the other hand, I can think of at least one of the, in which the two general election candidates were both registered Republicans because that's who came out of the non, the nonpartisan primary. And so it made you put a premium on you know, what your own qualifications were, what your philosophy was, it made it possible for people who were typically affiliated with other the other party from the one you belong to to support you because they weren't really deviating from any kind of party loyalty or anything. They were just doing what they thought was best for the court system. And I yeah. thought then and think now that that's the best, the best way to do it. Now, other people get to make that decision and they've made a different one. 
Well, as we know, and I think it's important for the listeners to understand, from 1868 until right around 2004, I right. think, we did yeah. elect I'm judges. Actually went, I actually went back and looked. I think the I think Superior Court judges became nonpartisan about 96. Okay, that's And then that's right. uh, the, uh, and I, I was surprised it was that far back. And then in the uh, 2002, 2003 time frame, uh, that the, uh, the same decision was made with respect to uh, appellate judges. I think that was at the same time, but I wouldn't want to be put under oath and made to swear right. to the accuracy of the statement I just made. And then um, in to, it's starting you know, in the process of coming back to uh, not to partisan elections didn't happen all at one fell swoop either. The uh, General Assembly restored party labels to the Court of Appeals races in 2016. Then they put party labels back on all races in 2018. And after 2018, they then made you a full scale party candidate because they then made you subject to uh, to party primaries. And so it is, I mean, you're correct that we had partisan elections for many, many years uh, changed uh, and then came back. Yeah. So uh, when you went on the Court of Appeals, and uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the Court of Appeals and the difference there versus uh, the state Supreme Court. Uh, did you already have in your mind a, a judicial philosophy or how you were going to uh, approach doing the work and, you know, tell the listeners exactly what the Court of Appeals does. Well, the Court, I mean, let me go at that in reverse order. The, the Court of Appeals uh, is, a, is a very little recognized but highly important part of our court system. It is responsible for hand for reviewing the decisions made by trial judges in almost all cases that are tried in the trial courts. Uh, and so for the most part, if you wind up being dissatisfied with a trial court judgment and you want to have somebody else take a look at the case, your case is likely to go to the Court of Appeals because they're there with, with a few exceptions, interestingly, utility commission general rate cases, capital cases, now business court cases, uh, re, uh, uh, for a while uh, decisions of constitutional three judge panels, although that's gone back to the Court of Appeals now. And, uh, for a while, also termination of parental rights cases. We just had a three-year period when we did those at the court at the Supreme Court when they were typically done at the Court of Appeals. Um, all appeals went through the Court of Appeals. Now, an appeal is not, this is the one thing I never was able to completely get through with my clients who were unsuccessful during my law practice, but a, an appeal is not a do-over. It is not a retrial. The purpose of it is to determine whether the trial judge made some kind of legal error, the admission of evidence, instructions to the jury, uh, granting a motion or denying a motion erroneously, that kind of thing. So it looks like sometimes from the outside, like we're studying anything and everything except what was really important in that case. But the idea behind the Court of Appeals has always seemed to me they're bound by the decisions of the North Carolina Supreme Court. They're bound by their own prior decisions. Uh, and so I've always thought of the job of the Court of Appeals as being to make sure that the law is applied uniformly statewide. That, and that may not be a great way to put it, but that's sort of what I thought I was doing when I was there was to make sure that the same decision would have been made in both Cherokee County and Dare County if I'd been asked to do that. Uh, and, and in there, terms it, of, it, it, it's, it's a, at the time you went on, it was, 12 judges, uh, and you sit in panels of three. It was 15, it was 15, 15 sitting in panels of three. Yeah. yeah. And I don't remember exactly when it went from 12 to 15. I, that was, you know, that was, I was safely ensconced on the Utilities Commission and not following that thing. That yeah, kind of thing. yeah, it was 12 we, when I went on, so yeah. But we sat, we sat, uh, we, the, the, we sat in panels of three that rotated uh, every three sessions of court. They would have, arg they would have argument or make decisions in cases twice each month. And so it, on the third time that panel met, it would then be the last time that panel met. Uh, and then a new one would be, you would be assigned to a new panel with three other people, I guess, to keep you from, you know, winding up being with the same people all the time, but instead to get, you know, expose you to fresh views. I thought it was a good system. And, uh, but you were responsible for voting on those cases, making a decision as to how they ought to come out. And then in a third of them, you were responsible for writing the opinion. Now, in terms of what philosophy I took to the job, 
I'm going to guess, I guess, reveal how much of a nerd I really am. But we taught when my dad and my granddad were still alive. We the we talked a lot about the role of judges, the role of, of, of governmental officials. We waited till dad came home from dinner for dinner every night from court when, when he was on the superior court. And then we, he would sit around and discuss the cases that he'd heard that day. Uh, and so I had a pretty good exposure to sort of the things that I, that the two of them thought were important about uh, judicial decision making. But it always seemed to me at bottom what you're supposed to do is figure out what if you're a trial judge, you do more of this than appellate judges do. Figure out what the facts are. Mostly that's done in the trial courts. And then the purpose of the appellate courts is to make sure that whatever ruling the trial court made as to what law was applicable on those facts was correct. And so the only thing you're really supposed to do as a judge is to figure out what the facts are. Once you know what the facts are, you and I, the family legacy is that my great grandfather always had some saying like salt down the facts, the law will keep, which I always assumed meant do the facts first. They might change. Uh, the law will be there when you get, get the facts straight. Uh, and, and to do that, I mean, dad emphasized very, very much that it was important to um, give everybody a fair hearing, that if a, per, if a litigant, particularly in a trial court, didn't think they'd been fairly heard, they were less likely to accept an adverse decision, not because necessarily they thought it was wrong, but just because they thought they hadn't been given a fair chance. And then the other thing that both of them emphasized was that nobody is above or below the law, that if all of us have legal responsibilities and legal rights and that uh, all everybody has the same basic legal rights and responsibilities and that's not a particularly theoretical philosophy it's a pretty fact specific case specific philosophy but that's about what i still use as my philosophy to this day i hear all these academic discussions but i think at the bottom line is that if you do those things you will probably be okay so at some point in time and this is certainly not an unusual occurrence over the last 30, 40 years, you decided you wanted to run for the North Carolina Supreme Court. Right. And the first go around, as I recall, you weren't successful. And then second time you were. So tell us about how you got to the Supreme Court. Well, I got to the Supreme Court just the way you indicated. I had, I, you know, I really enjoyed being on the Court of Appeals. And at the time that I was on the Uh, the, you know, then they included John Martin was the chief judge. Then, uh, Sanford Steelman from Union County was on the court. Marty Gear from Wake County was on the court. There were lots of, I mean, there were lots of others that were really able people and I enjoyed serving with them. And I thought we had a, a very, uh, Wanda Bryant from originally from Brunswick County, but then up, uh, came, came up to Raleigh with the attorney general's office, a, re a really good group of people and we worked really well together and I enjoyed being with them. But I finally, well, I don't know about finally, but I concluded after working for, working on things for a while that what I really enjoyed doing was the, having the opportunity to deal with pretty complex, uh, complicated cases that, you know, you needed to have a good result in in order to settle the law correctly for the benefit of the citizens of the state and of the, the uh, trial judiciary and much of what the court of appeals does. And it is important. And I don't want to demand, demand in any way suggest that it's not is taking pretty well established rules and making sure that they were properly applied to the facts. And I thought I was probably more suited for what I understood the Supreme court uh, to do than uh, what the, uh, uh, the court of appeals uh, does and did then. And so ran, as you indicated, unsuccessfully in 2012. And then I had thought at that point that that was the end of my effort to get to the, to get to the Supreme court, that it wasn't, wasn't meant to be. I was happy where I was, but I had continued to think about it in the, the months in early 2013 and finally decided I'd take another crack at it. I'm still not quite sure why except that I was concerned about, uh, you know, the, the, the court is an institution and uh, believing that I could make some, some, some contribution to its, to its work ran a second time. And the second time is not always the charm, but it turned out to be the case with my, with, with my race. 
And I've well, been now, really, really, I, I, really I, Yeah, I, I know there have been a couple of father-son individuals who have served on the North Carolina Supreme Court over the last 200 plus years. Uh, you have maybe the distinction of being the only grandfather, grandson, or is there another? Actually, actually, there's, a, actually there's another pair. Yeah. yeah. The Rodmans. Oh, okay. Of which I didn't realize till I got to the Court of Appeals. I think that uh, the seat that I currently hold, I think it's also the seat that you held. Right. It was also the seat that my grandfather held. And so, I mean, I tried to, you know, it, when you get back to about 1900, when they went from three to five, it becomes a little bit difficult to trace it back beyond. Right. That. But I, I, I spent a very rainy Saturday one day trying to figure out who held which seat and uh, discovered that I, I that I held granddad's seat, I think. But I, I believe the Rodmans and the Irvins are the two that are grand grand yeah. uh, grandfather, grandson. Which, which is a pretty pretty unique uh well it's pretty uh, it's pretty unique it's pretty unique to be able to serve on the court at all i haven't right. counted I, I haven't counted lately but i think in the history of the state the court as you know was created by the general assembly in 1818 and first sat in 1819 and i think it's only been like 104 105 people ever to serve on it and you know, I'm not sure that the odds on, on getting struck by lightning are <laughs> either better or worse, depending on how you want to look at it, than that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I, so I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of serving on our state's highest court, and that will lead us into this campaign uh, and a discussion about that. Uh, I, I have told folks that when I graduated from law school at UNC and 1975. I'm not sure I even knew we had a state constitution. All the mm -hmm. focus was on the U.S. Constitution. Right. And your your grandfather, Senator Sam, was a noted uh, expert on the U.S. Constitution. But today, the really controversial and critical cases that the North Carolina Supreme Court is hearing are really based on the North Carolina Constitution. So in, can in you many, talk a little in, bit about that? Yeah. Well, in, in many instances, that's true. And of course, North Carolina, you know, we do have a North Carolina Constitution, and the history of that Constitution is, is you know, been, been a subject that I've spent a lot of time looking into, uh, and is a really interesting subject. We've actually had, depending on how, how you want to count certain amendments, either three or five Constitution. We had a in in the in in seventeen seventy six the general assembly adopted the first state constitution uh it was amended substantially in eighteen thirty five that I think the principal change was to uh make the governor who had been previously appointed by the general assembly subject to popular election the the impetus behind those amendments was typically you and I are both from the western end of the state and our predecessors in Western North Carolina were complaining bitterly that we didn't have enough representation in the legislature and that the state government was not paying sufficient attention to what was going on in our neck of the woods. Some they things never I, change, right? Well, I mean, you know, you, I've, I've discovered that we have some company in some other parts of the state too. Yeah, right. But uh, so they modified it in 1835. They did not do a complete rewrite, but they, they changed it in some substantial ways. Uh, after the Civil War, as part of the uh, Reconstruction process, one of the things that we were required to do was to adopt a new state constitution that was, was, it had to include certain provisions uh, such as a prohibition on secession, a, a prohibition on uh, enslavement, uh, things of that nature to recognize that the, 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 that the Civil War had decided that and a number of other issues. And so in 1868, we had a state constitutional convention that totally rewrote the state constitution. The modern form of the state constitution was created in that convention that for the first time uh, made the judiciary, for example, and uh, 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 an independent branch of government before the Civil War. Judges had been appointed by the General Assembly. Now they were made a separate department of government that we had uh, 
uh, a number of other fairly advanced uh, provisions at the time, dealing with things like education, things of that nature. The, the original Constitution began with the Declaration of Rights. That was left pretty intact at the time. It was modified a bit to include things like the preservation of the fruits of one's labor, that kind of thing. Uh, in 10 years later, as part of the process by which the uh, pre-Civil War dominant uh, group, which was at that time affiliated with the Democratic Party, uh, obtained a passage in 1875 of some modifications to the state constitution that uh, I think limited the extent of the powers granted to local government, centralized a lot of that stuff in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, at the state level. Uh, they did not pass everything they wanted, but they got, they cut back to some extent on what the uh, 1868 constitution, which was adopted by a, uh, a Republican majority uh, uh, group at that time. Yeah. So we had that constitution. Then it was there were some additional modifications made in the 1930s that created the current Supreme Court size provision and did some other things like that. But the 1868 constitution, as modified in 1875, uh, remained in effect up until the, till the 19, to 1971, there were a couple of movements to try to modernize that constitution in the 1830s, excuse me, 1930s and 1950s, but they bore fruit in 1970 or in 1970 with a commission that did a complete redraft of the constitution, but with a few limited exceptions. The, the idea was to maintain what the 1868 Constitution had become, but put it in more modern language. And so while there certainly were some changes, they were not intended to be drastic. Since then, there had been some other amendments that gave, for example, the governor the right to succeed himself or herself. Uh, the governor's got the right to veto legislation that had not existed prior to uh, the passage of those amendments, but it's a real interesting process, and I've learned a lot just from studying. So, so why do you think we are having more litigation uh, focusing on provisions of the state constitution as well, opposed to the federal constitution? Well, you'll, to some extent, you'll have to ask the litigants that, but the uh, 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 and, you, and you may be better informed about the answer to that question than I am. But I think we're seeing it for several reasons. First of all, there are provisions in the state constitution that do not mirror anything in the federal constitution. There are various provisions. I've already alluded to one, the fruits of one's labor clause that does not appear in the federal constitution. There are others. For example, there's a provision, uh, uh, an anti-monopoly provision that uh, I think was probably originally intended mostly to deal with what a monopoly was in Elizabethan or Stuart, England. But... Mm -hmm has since been interpreted by the court more in line with the, uh, the Sherman Act of, of, of the 19th century. Uh, there, are, uh, there's, there are provisions that have a, uh, and I gotta be careful how I say this given pending litigation, there are provisions right. relating to education. Right. That well, you the, can say that's okay. <laughs> that the, uh, that the uh, I, I think it is safe to say that the court, uh, a couple of, you know, more than two decades ago held that our state constitution created a a right to a sound basic education based on provisions that are not found in the, in the United States constitution. And there are others. And so we've got, uh, and we've, we've also got something that the United States constitution doesn't have, which is a separate stated separation of powers provision that does not exist in the United States constitution, although there is a separation of powers doctrine recognized under the United States Constitution. So that's one reason you've got provisions that don't have any reflection in the federal constitution. And then uh, the court has uh, exercised the right to say that just because a provision appears in the state constitution that is mirrored in some respect in the uh, federal constitution, there is no requirement that those two provisions be construed as identical. Now, in many instances, the court has held that they should be. Yeah. Uh, and so, but there are others, and there are others that uh, that have been held not to be. And so, there are provisions that the court, over a period going back into the 1950s or before, held were more expansive, if you want to put it that way, than the equivalent provisions in the federal constitution have been construed. And so those two things, I think, are what contributes to the phenomenon that you're talking about. Yeah. So we're going to ease over into the campaign, but as, as a lead up to it, 
probably the single most troubling uh, label applied in the context of the judiciary, and not just in North Carolina, not just at the state Supreme Court, is the partisanship of the judges. Right. Now, every decision in the eyes of the public or the media is analyzed in the context of partisanship. Right. Which, you know, I, I will have to say, I've never heard a judicial candidate, you know, say, gee, that's the way it's supposed to be. Everybody, everybody understands, you know, the independence of the judiciary, uh, the nonpartisan aspect when you put on the black robe. But four or three votes, regardless of how the uh, the uh, majority stands, whether four Republicans, three Democrats, four Democrats, three Republicans, same true at the U.S. Supreme Court. You have to run in a partisan election. Mm -hmm. You have to do virtually all the things that um, other candidates who aren't running for judgeships have to do. How do you go about trying to dispel the public perception generally and then specifically uh, in the context of your campaign? Well, and, and, and it's, I would be less than candid if I didn't say it was difficult. I mean, we have a system, and I'm, and I'm not one of these that likes to blame the news media for everything that happens, because I think the news media has a difficult job, and I wouldn't want to be responsible for figuring out how to, comp to uh, cover complicated issues. But there is a tendency on the part of news coverage, first at the U.S. Supreme Court and now at our court, to do a partisan affiliation in our court or who appointed you uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court and, and to treat that as determinative. Uh, and I, it, it's very hard to overcome that sort of news coverage. It is also true that on occasions at both courts, uh, you wind up with all the people who you think of as one or the other joining against the folks on the other side. And it, my, it, my experience was when I got to the Supreme Court that we didn't seem to have that happen all that much. It has certainly increased more in recent times just as a matter of, you know, statistics. That's true, and it seems to be increasing at the um, um, U.S. Supreme Court as well. Uh, I mean, I, when you were at the Supreme Court, I don't know what the percentage, you know, I assume they had the uh, the internal report that we still get that says right. what percentage were unanimous and what were not. Uh, that certainly has declined over the course of the time when I got there, but a significant number of decisions at both courts are still unanimous now. Uh, and the other, the, 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 you know, so, so the, the, I think to some extent there may be an overstatement of the us against them approach uh, to analyzing the court. That said, um, it is difficult to explain to people that judges do things differently than the other two branches of government. The question we're supposed to ask ourselves, as I said earlier, is what's the law on a particular subject? Not what do I think the particular, you know, what do I think the law ought to be? Not if I was the platonic garden, guardian of the universe, I would be, uh, what I do for myself or my dad used to refer to judges as not having what he described as a roving commission to do justice by which he meant, um, you know, do whatever you think's right in the individual circumstances. And all I can say is that, that I certainly try very hard myself to examine each case individually and to decide each case based upon what I think the law and the facts call for. Uh, and at, at some point, you just have to look at a particular judge's record and decide whether you think that judge is doing what he or she says. And so, uh, you know, as you've already alluded to the fact, I'm the Democratic nominee for the for the court this time. Uh, it is not you know, to be the Democratic nominee. I have to be a registered Democrat. And it's not any great secret that I that's what I've been a long time. Right. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at the decisions that I've actually made, uh, you will find cases in which um, I, if you were to predict how I was going to act based solely upon my party affiliation and the surrounding circumstances, you would have predicted I would do one thing when I did another. And some examples of that are 
uh, in, in these are cases in which uh, some of the people that uh, you would think of with my political allies weren't too happy about, but they, but, but we did them anyway. We had a, we had a decision a number of years ago in which the General Assembly passed a statute that required gubernatorial cabinet appointees to be confirmed by the General Assembly. That had never been required before, uh, but the court upheld it. Uh, I think we may have even been unanimous in that case on the theory that, and, and so even though the, the governor, who was a member of my political party, did not like that. We voted to uh, uphold the General Assembly's authority to do that. Now, we did leave some room for an as-applied challenge in some very limited circumstances, but generally speaking, we upheld it. Another example was the General Assembly a number of years ago passed a statute in which the division of responsibility between the state superintendent of public instruction and the state board of education was changed. You're probably pretty familiar with that. One. I am. I am. And, and, we'll uh, go into that. And, and I wrote an opinion that essentially construed that statute in a particular way and then held that it, it was, this was not a unanimous decision. And interestingly, my recollection is there were two dissenters, one from each party uh, who uh felt that that statute was was inconsistent with the provisions governing the state board of elections. I felt like if you construed them the way that I construed them, they weren't. Uh, more recently, we had a uh, the General Assembly and the governor got into a fracas over who, who got to decide how money derived from federal grants was spent. And I um, wrote an opinion and I think it was a 6-1 decision that held that uh, in that particular instance, the uh, General Assembly and not the governor had the authority, final authority to make that decision. Now, you know, so I mean, I've got a record when I thought it was appropriate to uh, make decisions that if you were to look purely at my party affiliation, you might not have expected that I would make. Now, on the other hand, have I made decisions that uh, people in my party might be happier with? Sure. And people in the other party. Under. We're not. I yeah. mean, you know, it's, it, but I think the, I think the test ought to be when you look at somebody's record, can you see evidence in which that person is actually making a decision based upon uh, a view of the law rather than upon one's political affiliation? And one way to tell whether that judge is doing what he or she says he's or she's doing is do you find instances in which that judge does things that you would not expect based on, at our level, party affiliation at the U.S. Supreme Court level, who appointed them. Yeah. So so talk a little bit on how you transition that philosophy of not being partisan to the campaign trail in a statewide election where we have almost seven and a half million registered voters, a third Democrat, a third Republican, a third unaffiliated. And, and most of the unaffiliated are really one or the other, but they just choose for, you know, perfectly reasonable reasons, which is typically they, that gives them a right to vote in the primary of their choice by each election rather than being limited to one or the other. I mean, you know, I think we will continue to see more and more unaffiliated all the time. Uh, I, you know, all I can say is that when I, I do not, make speeches that's at political gatherings that say vote for me because I'm a Democrat. What I say is that I am, and this is the way I decide, this is my background. This is the way I decide cases. Uh, you, you're not necessarily always going to like every decision that I make because I base them on, base them on what I think the law is rather than instead of what I personally would do if I was in the General Assembly in some instances, uh, and say in effect that I think the best interest of the state is served by a a judiciary that that functions in that fashion, and and point to the fact that sometimes when I'm given more time to speak than I generally am, yeah. uh, point to the fact that for example in recent years we've had, you know, occasions in which people of both parties have been required to to make fairly courageous stands in favor of following the law as compared to, you know, what the political winds would suggest that they ought to do in their own interest and suggest that that's really what we need in our government is more of that uh, rather than uh, blind allegiance to particular people or particular parties. And, you know, I, my sense is that it, once people listen to you say that for a while, uh, you, you, um, 
uh, that, that it resonates. Now, I will, you know, again, say that among other things, I, I usually say I don't like the idea, like I have in this interview, that I don't like the idea of partisan judicial elections. I don't think that's uh, uh, the best way to pick judges that I, you know, in the end, but at the end of the day, what you should want, if you're a registered Democrat or a registered Republican, what you should want is a person that decides cases based on the merits and not on the basis of politics. And, you know, we'll, we'll see if that resonates or not. So uh, the Republican ticket is there, there are two seats up on the Supreme court. You're the incumbent mm -hmm. in one seat. Uh, you're being challenged by Trey Allen. Right. Uh, uh, the other seat is an open seat because Justice Hudson uh, is not running for re-election. So there, there are two candidates, one Democrat, one Republican, uh, Judge Dietz and Judge Inman running for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. There are, what, five Court of Appeals races? Uh, four. Four. Four, okay. Four. So uh, the Republicans have run as a ticket. They, since day one, they've been... Right you know, labeled themselves the conservatives. Right. As, as the Democratic candidates, you know, tried to run a cohesive campaign, do you do it on, on your own? What? Well, we, you know, we, have, we for example, have, uh, we do have a, you know, card that has everybody's picture on it that's equivalent to the one that you've seen on the other side. Uh, we have uh, we certainly appear at many of the same forums. Uh, we, you know, I, I read will read off the names of the of the Democratic candidates if because as you know from your own experience, nobody knows who any of these nominees are anyway, and so name recognition is worth something. So yes, given that we are given that the General Assembly has said that we are. Uh, going to be running on a party ticket. I mean, it, it, we recognize that there is the, you, you know, we do hand out that kind of material, but I always say when I'm asked to speak, essentially what I've said here is close I can to, uh, I don't have a podium to pound on or anything, but right. uh, I have tried very hard to say that the message of the, of my campaign is the one that I've tried to, to give in this interview. Uh, do we cooperate on various things? Of course. I don't think there's any, uh, um, I mean, any doubt about that, and I'm not making, I don't want to be understood as pretending to the contrary. Uh, I think that it is, that, that is an artifact of having partisan judicial elections, and there are people that will defend that and say that it gives voters information that they want. I, it's interesting, I don't know, did you, I don't remember if you attended the bar convention or not this summer. No, we were out of the country. So. Well, they, they had us, they had a, a session that showed a poll result uh, that was taken. I don't. They, I don't remember who the pollster was, but it was supposedly a reputable organization that um, indicated that something in the neighborhood of seventy percent of the people in the state didn't want partisan elections. They thought, uh, and, and the percentage of lawyers that wanted nonpartisan elections was several points higher. Yeah. Uh, and so we. I mean, I think that most of my the folks that I am on the Democratic ticket with agree with that. They they seem to that seem to from the 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 the, uh, the things that they say, but we are each running on our own qualifications. All of all of the Democratic candidates have uh, either present or prior judicial experience, uh, and that's the way we've been running a ticket. The Republican Party, frankly, if you're looking at it from purely, uh, you know, pure in a purely purely political fashion, they've emphasized these races for a long time, and the the Democratic Party is, uh, I think, catching up with it. Uh, but again, I wish we weren't in that environment to begin with. Yeah. But so I don't, in, I don't get to make that decision. So uh, yeah, understood. So in in the last couple of minutes here, uh, tell the listeners uh, about any endorsements or particular points that you want to emphasize, and then where can they go to get additional Im information about your campaign if they are truly starved for additional information <laughs> they, they, they can go to my campaign website which is www.irvinforjustice.org we have a facebook page i don't claim to be the world's greatest uh, social media person uh but we do put information up there as well it's uh facebook.com slash irvin for justice you can get to uh, you can get to that um uh, uh, 
website and see something about what I'm up to in a particular instance. I guess that I'm not good. I've gotten a good number of endorsements. I think it's fair to say that I've gotten by far the larger number of endorsements in this race. But the two that I want to mention are uh, I have been endorsed, first of all, by the North Carolina Advocates for Justice, who are a who are the is the point basically the plaintiff's lawyers in the state. Uh, they also include the civil defense lawyers. I mean, the criminal defense lawyers. And then on the other hand, I've also been endorsed by the North Carolina Association of Defense Attorneys. So those folks are the ones who represent civil defendants, insurance companies, businesses, things of that nature. And what I, you know, these are the people that litigate against each other. These are not like two people on the same sides. These are two people on differing sides, but both of them have endorsed my candidacy for re-election. They can explain for themselves why they did that better than I can. But I hope that the fact that people on opposite sides of the table in a courtroom have chosen to suggest that I ought to be reelected is that both of them feel like they've gotten a fair shake from me as a, as a judge over the period of time that I've been on the Court of Appeals and on the Supreme Court. And I take some comfort from the fact that these organizations were willing to support me, even though I have handed down decisions over the course of my career that I'm sure both of them would have preferred that I didn't do. But I think they have confidence in my fairness and in my impartiality. And I want to at least mention those two because I think it's at least some signal that I try to, that I really hopefully succeed in doing what I try to do. Well, uh, Justice Jimmy Irvin, uh, incumbent member of the North Carolina Supreme Court and the Democratic nominee for the seat that he currently holds on the North Carolina Supreme Court. I've enjoyed this opportunity to talk with you. Thanks for uh, taking time. I don't, I don't get the opportunity anymore to ask, uh, ask you questions. You get to ask me questions if I show up uh, uh, in court, but it's, uh, uh, well, I, it's I, I, I try to, I try to be even handed about it. I don't want you to feel like I never ask you anything. Well, that's, that's right. Well, I ask you questions. You ask me questions that's right. over the years, but thank you so much. Uh, I remind folks that uh, uh, you can go to WPVM 103.7's uh, website in Asheville uh, for uh, the videos of this. And this will be broadcast uh, several times between now and the election. Uh, and thank you very much, Justice Irvin. Uh, we wish you the best, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Th thank you very much, Justice Orr. It's always great to see you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.